you put up with so much and then you've had enough and then what have you got? You've got a strike, haven't you? You've no other way. You've got to demonstrate. Well, we thought it was pretty clear, really, that there was good and evil. It's only later in your life you discover, actually, it's not quite as simple as that. I began to find myself getting more and more bolshy and talking more as I was wearing a cloth cap and standing in the car park at British Leyland. Without a union, we wouldn't have had a leg no. to stand on. Scratch the surface of anyone over 35 and you'll probably find a striker. Between the 1960s and the 1980s, striking was something millions of us did. We came to striking for all kinds of reasons. And some of the most surprising people were strikers. I didn't start off as a supporter of um, industrial action. I started off as a supporter of sweet reason, um, as I saw it. Norman Tebbit became the trade unionist's bogeyman when he was in government, but in the 1960s, he was a pilot at BOAC and a union activist. Fasten your seatbelts, ready for takeoff. Thank you. And when we introduced the 707, for example, the management was so poor at its own job that eventually it fell to myself and another co pilot to show the management how to schedule the crews. If the captain wants a cup of coffee, they serve it on the flight deck. And there are always plenty of empties here, too. So there we were, two ordinary guys, doing the work which should have been done by the management. I was beginning to get slightly bolshy by then. <laughs> How does the staff feel about this dispute? Well, of course, we're all very concerned. I need hardly tell you. Like most of the pilots, the trade union reformer was ready to strike. But first, he just worked to rule. Guy comes out with a flight plan, and you just say, no, I'm terribly sorry, old boy, but that's not right not going to sign that, and leave him to find out what the mistake is. It's, a, it's an awful way to behave, you know, it just, it just rubs and it's unpleasant. But that was our minimum response, you know, to indicate to the management we were getting quite serious. It started when I was quite young. You know, I organised industrial action amongst the paper boys when I was the paper boy, you know. Former BBC Director General Greg Dyke continued to lead industrial action when he became a trainee newspaper hack. That was the sort of person I was. I always thought you could, you know, I railed against everything, wanted to change everything. I organised for all the journalists across the group, I don't know, about 60, all came to one meeting with the managing director, the managing director, and there was nobody above about 21. And the managing director looked at us and said, look, there's no point giving you more money because you'll only spend it on things like portable radios. It was like peer pressure, you know. Um, I remember Paul McCartney once said that he took drugs because of peer pressure, and yet he was a Beatle. Eddie Shaw would be besieged by mass pickets at his Warrington printing works in 1983. Back in 1970, Shaw was besieging Granada TV as a striking floor manager. But that was under duress. When the person next to you looks at the person next to him and he says yes, and they all say yes, like sort of dominoes in the line, you just stick your hand up as well. You know, and I, to be honest with you, most of us really didn't worry about what was right or wrong. This night in the pub at Wursborough was the first time his wife Anne had allowed herself to be filmed with Arthur. Anne Scargill, ex-wife of NUM leader Arthur Scargill, was used to the fallout from strikes. She's seen stories criticising her 15-year-old daughter for going to upper-class events like Jim Carner's. There was right-wing uproar when her husband appeared in a new Volvo car. So they said, ah, what a story. Mrs. Scargill. <laughs> but surprisingly, Crosses Anne only came to the picket line when the miners were striking against pit closures in 1984. Before the miners' strike, I just went to work. I had a daughter. 
Arthur's dad lived with us. And then in 1984, all hell broke loose, not only with me, but with all the other women. I should have, definitely should have, voted against. That was a lack of courage on my part, frankly. As editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie would be a staunch opponent of strikes. But three years before he led the paper, he found himself striking against it. It would have been impossible to cross the picket line. I, I neither had the courage, nor, by the way, would the management have welcomed me with open arms. What was I going to do? If I'd gone in there and sat down, it would just have been a way of earning money for doing nothing, because the printers would have blacked my output and would never have handled it anyway. Printers sitting back there, oh, bloody lovely, this. More strikes, the better, sir, right? So there was, I wouldn't have achieved anything by crossing the picket line. Actually, I don't regret that. You can't really call the DHSS industry, it's like a farce. I mean, it was a, <laughs> it was um, just like 14,000 people shuffling bits of paper, waiting for them to invent computers, basically. Viz comic editor Chris Donald was surprised to find he was on strike because no one in his union had told him. All we knew about it was that the, the boss said, oh, by the way, there's this strike thing tomorrow, you don't have to come in. So we went, OK, so we didn't come in. They were quite happy for you to not come in and then come back a day later. They didn't want people sort of going and, and um, standing next to braziers and calling people scabs and things like that. So, striking sucked in some surprising people. There are many reasons why people strike. All those in favour, please show. <laughs> but at the heart of most strikes, there's usually a grievance. None of the girls got any doubts at all. We know what we're fighting for we and we're prepared to stay there till we get it. Yes. Women don't make a habit of coming out on strike for nothing. Ford's Dagenham plant in 1968. The women's reason for going on strike? Sex discrimination. The Trade Union Congress and the Labour Party are on record for equal pay for women. They made car seats and were classed as less skilled than men doing the same work. They were also on a special, lower, women's pay rate. It's wake-up time, isn't it? You're working mm. and you're thinking, I should be getting more for this because it's see, it's a skill. Mm. So it's wake-up time. Eileen Pullen and Vera Syme will rub shoulders with politicians to highlight their grievance. They were sweeping the floor. They got the same grade as what we did. The sweeper couldn't get onto a machine, but we could... Do the cleaning. It's right, isn't That's it? That's right, yeah, yeah. Because that's the only way you got anywhere with yeah. Forge. You had to strike, didn't you? Yeah. Unfortunately. Sheila Douglas and Gwen Davis also worked in the upholstery shop. It was always men's uh, yes. problems that were being fought over, <laughs> not ours. <laughs> Football was rocked by a one-man strike in the 1960s. The reason? Contracts that would make some of today's overpaid stars blanch. It was a slavery contract. If they want you, they, you're obliged to sign the contract. And if you don't, they don't even have to pay you. They didn't even have to give you the £20 a week. Newcastle United star George Eastham's contract meant he earned little and couldn't move without the club's say-so. All footballers were on the same deal, but Newcastle's star striker was ready to go on strike. If you believe in something firmly and you're prepared to do something about it, then you must do it. Public sector manual workers were angered by a government pay ceiling of 5% in 1979. They staged a series of strikes in the winter of discontent. Round here, gentlemen. Right. Here we are. What's your normal jobs? Huh. We're both administrators. So what does that mean? That means we're doing non-administrative duties. <laughs> As you can see. It was inevitable that it was going to happen. The government knew it was going to happen. 
Ian Lowe's led the Liverpool gravedigger strike. Their reason? Working in Dickensian conditions for low pay. A fellow would travel round on a, a dumper truck with a tea in a can and would pass it on to the two grave diggers um, who were still down the grave eating sandwiches covered in dirt. Those people worked under appalling conditions um, were treated with contempt by the employer and uh, they'd had enough, quite frankly. I'm asking you to support the Joy Shop Stewards recommendation. There were almost 12 strikes a week at one British Leyland plant in the late 1960s. Many of Leyland's walkouts were caused by its pay system. All the workforce were organised into gangs. Your world was dominated by the politics of that gang in relationship to the rest of the factory. Shop steward Bill Lancaster called a spontaneous wildcat strike without union backing. The reason? His gang was paid less than another gang. We just said to the foreman, how much are we getting for this? And we were told, and we just said, right, that's it. And we just walked out and brought the whole place to a standstill for three days. I guess, looking back at hindsight, I should have felt guilty, but I didn't, because everybody else was doing it. It was, you know, it was, it was an incredible atmosphere to work in. Whether the individual agreed or not, sometimes they had little choice about striking. The closed shop meant you had to be a union member to work, break the strike, and you could be out of the union and your job. And we'd often have a meeting once a week and we'd all sit into some left-winger sort of yelling and screaming and we'd all sit there nodding and thinking, you know, how much longer is he going to go on for? And then we'd all go. And it was a senseless thing to me because we were fighting for a small percentage increase, which would take us years to pull back. I think we were out for about three or four weeks. You're still staying out? Yeah. You're not going back at all? No, no, no. How strong was the feeling at the meeting this morning? Very strong. 100%. There are many reasons for striking, although they're not always obvious to everyone. What we came out for, I think, it was for something the electricians were complaining about. And we were out and they were in. <laughs> and we was astonished. Between the 1960s and the 1980s, British workers embarked on one of the country's most intense periods of strike action. The Snatch Squad moved in. Almost 8 million working days were lost on average each year due to strikes. And a familiar weapon was used, mass picketing. And you could just see the field and hear the noise. And it was like something out of a science fiction movie with all these black figures with big shields in front of them, banging on the shields. In May 1984, the aptly named Norman Strike a miner from Tyneside was part of a mass picket trying to stop lorries leaving the Orgreave coking plant. And there was rows of horses with guys with visors on and crash helmets and truncheons and it was like, poor bloody hell. You know, and you're there and all you've got, you haven't got a lump of wood, you haven't got a stone, you haven't got anything, you just got you. Uh, somebody set fire at the field. Uh, and my trousers was on fire at the bottom. But I didn't know the way. Somebody said, oh, your trousers are on fire. Just then, the line parted and they're just going charging out on these horses. Well, when you see a bloody big horse with a copper on the back of it, charging towards you, you don't hang around to give it some sugar. You run, you just turn and you run. And that's what I did. And I could hear, whoo, whoo, behind my head, just, just missing me and that was spurting us on. I, I'm not fit and I wasn't fit then either. But I got away from them horses, didn't they? They never got me that day. The violent confrontation came when the pickets reacted to police manoeuvres to protect one of the newspaper vans. Oh, what happened last night was mob rule, and it was only afterwards when the police took control that we managed to get our vans out. In the early 80s, former striker and now newspaper publisher Eddie Shaw took on the print unions. Move back, please. Mass pickets tried to close his Warrington plant. Shah took it as a declaration of war. You have to treat it like war. And I've never been to war, so I don't, you know. But I, but I mean, I mean, to me, it was, um, it was frightening. But it won, which I couldn't, I couldn't let them not win because they could have won. But I, I mean, you know, it's just one I was, I wasn't prepared to to give in, and I'd have given everything up for it, everything, because. 
they were bastards. I mean, some of our staff were very left-wing, <clears throat> you know, but they wouldn't give in. Our politics were miles apart, but this had just brought us together. Even the news went on strike. ITN journalists demanded parity with the BBC in 1974. Peter Snow joined the picket line. It was enormously exciting. I mean, I bought a bottle of whiskey every day to the picket line. We had a great fun. We had three days. We were actually on, on strike, I think, at the time. I found myself turning into a sort of passionate rabble rouser. My view always was that I, more than anybody, should be part of the fight because presenters, reporters, people who are earning more money than most of the other people in the struggle, they should be the ones who are there on the, on, on the picket line. I'm absolutely clear, crystal clear about that. The one problem with this strike was that there was an election coming up. Would people then have crossed the picket line? Would I have crossed the picket line? I don't know. I would have been very, very much in a dilemma as to what to do. 20 years later, that dilemma would come back to haunt him. Don't accept the point of view that the strike is caused purely by the strikers. I think there's, there are always two sides to this. And in this case, the corporation have to take more than their share of the blame. Well, a lot of people think that they're already being paid too much. What do you think? No, I don't think so. Would you like to drive one of these for the money that they get? The BOAC pilots walked out in June 1968, and Norman Tebbit finally became a striker. By the time I got to it, yes, I was quite ready to do it. And in fact, I was on the pilot's council of the 707 fleet at that time. So um, I, I was fully committed to it. You know, I decided there wasn't any other way. But Tebbit's union, Balper, was too posh to pick it. I'm prepared to stay out until we get our results. And I've made arrangements to see myself through for a long, long time. There are lots of casual labor jobs. What do you mean by casual labor? Um, well, it, this time of year, there's, uh, you can pitch hay for quite a reasonable fee, provided it's dry, drive trucks. As airline pilots, we were bolshy in a very middle-class sort of way. You know, we, we didn't carry placards and we didn't have picket lines. Um, uh, I took the view that if you couldn't maintain the support of your members for that strike action without a picket line, then you hadn't really got a terribly good case. And people were assaulted. People were threatened. A couple of people had their uh, nervous breakdowns. So a group of men turned up in a van and with pickaxe handles. And we had to actually withdraw um, pickets after the first day because we weren't going to be able to get our message across. Um, it, it was a strike that uh, never got any support from the public. The media and the, uh, the politicians actually demonised that group of workers. The extraordinary speed with which Rupert Murdoch uprooted his newspapers from Fleet Street still has the unions reeling. Mr Murdoch said, move out. And that was the end of this newsroom. Thousands of newspaper workers lost their jobs in a switch from hot metal to new technology at Wapping. Here computers actually set the stories, replacing the linotype machinery. The mass pickets were fighting for self-preservation and power. Each day, former striker Kelvin McKenzie, now editor of The Sun, drove through them. And I'd go like that, given the V sign out the window, go, Rah! <laughs> and there'd be another surge like that. Anyway, that, that went on for about two nights. And uh, I get a phone call from, uh, uh, from uh, Rupert Murdoch. He calls me up and he says, uh, I hear you've been, uh, you've been uh, aggravating the pickets. And I said, well, yes, that is probably slightly true. He said, well, get this message. I said, oh, yes, what is it? He said, pack it up! Bang! Oh, dear, oh, dear. So I, so I packed it up. I stopped... I stopped it. It was the most enjoyable part of the evening. And part of the day, you flog yourself all day, kiss and tell, my bloody night with a rhino, 
three nuns and the blinking king of Siam. You know, you'd have all this, you know. And then at the only light spot in the whole day, around about half past nine at night, there it goes. Like that. The energy would be fantastic. In recent weeks, the dispute at Wapping has often turned ugly. There have been scenes of violence, and in Parliament last week, the Home Secretary called it a thoroughly dangerous situation. The police were saviours or villains, depending on which side you were on. The police saved our lives and saved that company. These guys would have killed me and would definitely have destroyed that plant if they could have got, got in amongst it. Police, outnumbered around two to one, pushed the pickets 50 yards further from the main gate. My mum, who was a, a born-again Christian, was against me. She thought the strike was wrong, she thought I was wrong, she was reading the sun. And she saw me standing in the street and I was black and blue where I'd been beaten up and black eye. And she said, who's done that to you? And I said, the police. And she said, right. And then she was on our side from then on. Norman Strike's picketing led to his arrest and imprisonment. More than 11,000 arrests were made for alleged offences linked to the minor strike. Anne Scargill made her first appearance in court, charged with obstruction. Mrs Scargill was in the witness box for 35 minutes and she denied almost every detail given by the police of her arrest outside Silverhill Colliery. She told the magistrates, I was very frightened, the police seemed very hostile. And they took me into a small room, very small this room. And I got in there and there's a policewoman with me. And she said to me, come on, get undressed. I says, pardon? She says, get undressed. I says, what for? And there were a bath outside, I thought. I says, I'm not dirty. She says, get undressed. So, I just looked and, do you know, it was terrible. I says, do you know I'm old enough to be your mother? She says, I'm only doing my job. I says, yes, Lord, that's what they said in Nazi Germany. When they were taking Jews to be slaughtered, they were only doing the job. Are you going to celebrate? She was cleared of all charges. Well, we've won the strike, yes. Yeah. The police began protecting miners who worked during the strike. Flying pickets made an appearance. We soon realised there was no need to pick at our pit because nobody was, was even thinking of going in. So we left a few people on permanent duty at the pit and then we started to branch out to try and bring other pits around the area out as well. And then once Durham was solid, um, we tried to go to Nottingham but we were stopped. In Nottinghamshire, the coal board says 24 of the 25 pits are working despite about 1,400 pickets. Officers have been busy stopping cars since dawn. About 150 vehicles have been sent back to Yorkshire, most of them carrying at least four passengers. I was happy, yeah. Over the moon. Delighted. Yeah, Jim, of course you can have it. Jack Charlton became an unlikely hero to the pickets. Their cars were known to the police, so they borrowed his. I mean, and the next thing I knew, a police had knocked on the door and said they'd found my car parked somewhere in workshop. And uh, was I aware of what I was doing, that I was giving a car to... And I said, yeah, of course I was. I don't think the police were too pleased about it, but they couldn't do anything about it either. I suppose it was me thinking at least I made a contribution to a strike which involved the people that I grew up with. In the quiet streets of London or any other town, there hasn't been a revolution in people's lives since ITV screens went dark more than a month ago. But there are some things they can't talk about any longer when they go down to the pub. I think it's a bloody nuisance because it keeps my kids quiet. 
And I like Coronation Street and Crossroads and BBC just as rubbish. Picketing for Greg Dyke in 1979 was a breeze. I used the ITV strike to spend a lot of time windsurfing, actually. I spent a lot of time in Wales windsurfing. I used to come back every week for my day on the picket line. The head of industrial relations there was very anxious that at the end of the strike, the relations between the management and the unions would still be all right. So we used to pick it inside the building. He let us pick it inside on the grounds that we might get wet if it rained outside. Picketing wasn't the only weapon the strikers could use. Other tactics could be equally effective. Both sides found new ways to press home their advantage. There was a complete blockade of the Humber Bridge this morning. 600 miners abandoned cars on approach roads and brought chaos to rush hour traffic. The men had been thought to be heading for the Scunthorpe Steelworks, but stopped here when police spotted their convoy. Striking newspaper workers lost their jobs when Eddie Shaw challenged the closed shop. But what got in the headlines was that he'd taken on the compositors' union, the mighty NGA. It established him as a union basher. Shaw claims the unions tried a tactic of their own in the run-up to the dispute. His wife, Jennifer, was in hospital fighting cancer. She was in bed and she had a bad day. And uh, Dr. Sherry Davis, who was the guy who was dealing with her, he said, I think we're going to lose her today. And during that, one of the nurses came to me. And she had tears in her eyes. She said, the union want to talk to you. And I said, well, I, I can't. And she said, they said, if you don't talk to them, they will close, they will call the pickets out at 4 o'clock. And I said, just leave it. And they didn't come out. They're animals. The leaders of unions basically are animals. They don't give a damn about people. I do actually loathe them. If I hadn't seen her, especially that day in November, fighting life and death, where there is no gray in between, it's black and white, you know, it's death or not. I think that became, the, and then what the union said that day, that became, I guess, one of the most defining points of my life. Um, and from that point on, I was never in trouble. I never really had real fear. Because when you've seen somebody who you love that much face that, you know, you're going to be left with three kids, et cetera, et cetera. You know, everything after that, it's, I wouldn't say it's easy peasy, but it, it becomes a lot of everything. You know, you focus more on what really matters. At LWT, just the threat of walking away from negotiations was sometimes all it took to get a result. We demanded an 18% local agreement increase. And the management offered us 4%. And we just said, no, that's totally unacceptable. And we got up to leave and they offered us 15 or 16%. And we looked at each other and it was, how do you get out this room before they take it away? But while we were there, we said, well, all right, but we also want a television. Everyone's entitled to a television. Everyone's entitled to a video recorder. And they said, yes, and yes. And we thought, it's time to go. But we always reckoned if we'd asked for a pop-up toaster, we'd have got that as well. In a sense, we were all frightened of the British unions. Journalist Anne Leslie found herself caught up in a battle to control the media. They absolutely had enormous power over newspapers and journalists. In a strike, getting the right publicity is a key tactic. During the whopping dispute, the print union sometimes fought hostile publicity with censorship. Hello and thank you very much. Welcome to another Question Time, your weekly hour of lively argument. Anne Leslie. So the Fleet Street chapels got terribly used to behaving like muggers. You know, they'd come along, cosh the management. The management would, when hit in the back of the neck, say, oh, OK, old boy, give everything they want. Now the unions have met a super mugger in the form of <laughs> Rupert Murdoch. New technology has come and something has got to be done to accommodate. OK. David that Orton, comment took her off the newsstands the next day. I said to the features editor, what happened to my piece? Uh, sorry, Anne, um, the unions wouldn't print it. <laughs> Hang on. There's nothing about them. No, but, you know, they said, you know, they're not printing anything by you for a while. It was a warning. Don't mess with us. Don't criticise us. Or you won't be used. You won't be printed. There were some printers refused to print stuff that I'd done unless I was a member of a print union. So I wrote off to um, one of the print unions, I think it was Slade, they called it, and, 
I never even got a reply. So from then on, on the back of me, me artwork, I used to write Noddy Holder Slade, and they used to, <laughs> I, I got away with that for most of the time. I had a great picture. It was a picture of Scargill, you know, and he had his hand up like that uh, as, as you might think, a, a sort of almost semi-Nazi salute. Had it up there like that. And I wrote the headline, Mein Führer, M-I-N-E. Hey, eh? you genius. Eh? Thanks very much. Mine will be a Pulitzer Prize. Where do I sign? And uh, the printers objected to that on behalf of showing solidarity, <laughs> solidarity with the miners what are going through difficult times and refused to print the paper. And they were out on strike for about three days over Mine Fury. There was a collective madness going on in the industrial scene. And these guys were in and out of number 10, by the way. I'm surprised their waistlines didn't expose sandwiches, beer, tea, anything. They were really the political czars of their time. Well, can you tell us what you decided this morning? No, no, we can't. Why are you so secretive? Why? Because it's always distorted. That's well, it's not be if you tell us what happened. We just got contempt for the press. At first, the Ford women weren't friendly with the media. But they soon learned how to use the press and milk good publicity. They began courting politicians and posing for the cameras. They got out the placards and demonstrated. Ginger Lil's banner was We Want Sex Equality. It's a big banner, huge thing, and it was big letters, and the bottom either got creased up or rolled up or whatever, and it said We Want Sex, <laughs> and all the... All the taxis and lorries and shouting and everything, and they didn't realise why. And I said, it could only happen to you, Lil, couldn't it? <laughs> Things didn't go according to plan for Norman Strike either. He tried to use the tube to publicise the miners' cause. On tambourine, on additional percussion, and on strike for 35 weeks at Durham Minor. I was a bit nervous about going on the television because they were saying it's a live television programme. We don't want anybody to know who you are. Um, so I had to stand at the back. I came out, did my spiel, but there was no sound. A technical fault denied Norman his soapbox. <laughs> Successful tactics can increase the effect of another essential strike component. Pressure. It's felt by every striker. Are you prepared to accept the 2%? Were well, you prepared to win, brother? If you're not prepared to accept the 2%. Pressure tests individual resolve. Were you intensified even further? Well, we're flat out on strike now. It's difficult to do more than that, short of setting fire to the aeroplane. The pressure was mounting on Norman Tebbit. Newly selected Tory candidates aren't usually strikers. And that was very, very unpleasant. Uh, my neighbours and friends, of course, all thought it, thought it was hilariously funny um, that, uh, that I was on strike. And I remember the agent, a delightful guy called Frank Pike, ringing me up one day and saying, I'm suffering a crisis of identity. I'm a political agent in Islington. My party runs the council, and one of my parliamentary candidates is on strike. Am I the Labour agent or the Conservative agent? <laughs> the two sons refused to have Mrs Mason cremated, so they crossed the picket lines and dug the grave themselves. I can remember one of the grave diggers who was actually on strike. It was, um, it was followed after being out in the pub having a drink and was assaulted. And there was another uh, member who was on strike, who, during the strike, uh, a member of his own family died. And that individual was, um, was ostracised by the rest of his family. He was uh, turfed out of his home and was actually sleeping rough.
dispute will continue. We are make we are producing newspapers week after week. We will continue to produce newspapers week after week. Eddie Shaw appeared confident as he defied the pickets and printed his papers, but in private, he too was feeling the pressure. I was frightened. I lie awake at night thinking, not was I doing the right thing, but you know how's this going to end? And there was always something new happening. You know, and you think, God, I've got to react to that. I've got to react to that. Um, but no, you just had to keep going. I mean, I mean, we were too small a company to stop. And they sent two big coffins and three little ones around to the house one night and had him delivered and banged on the door. And Jennifer was there on her own. And she came down. And the guy said, this is, they delivered few. And he just walked away. And there's these coffins sitting at three for the kids and two for us. I said to Jennifer, um, maybe it's time to give up now. And she's the daughter of an ex-group captain of the RAF and everything, wartime, etc. And she said, if you do, and she's only five foot seven, and she said, if you do, I'm leaving you. And I had a choice between five foot seven on one side and 10,000 pickets a night on the other side. Easy choice. There was no, no, you know, that was it. I was not going to take her on, you know. Even the most outwardly robust may buckle. During a strike at the Sun in 1984, Kelvin McKenzie published the paper by himself. When the pressure was off, he realised the cost. The management came to me and said, it's been settled, it's over. And I remember bursting into tears, grabbing my coat, walking out, and taking a few days off. I, you know, I felt real tension. It was a tension connected with winning. I felt I'd defeated these guys. I thought they were wrong to have done what they did, but also long hours and emotion and everything. You know. There wasn't even any alcohol involved. In For every strike, there's a price to pay. Into the drains went more than a million pints that would have slaked the thirst of Midland holidaymakers and brought publicans more than £350,000. Financial pressure hits all sides where it hurts. The miners stayed out for a year and the union's assets were frozen. Whole communities were on the breadline. Even the leadership was affected. My husband didn't have any wages in the strike. My husband didn't have any wages for 18 months after the strike because the union was sequestrated. I worked, I only worked three days part time. But no, we didn't have an income, only my wage, three days, like a lot of other women had. No, we didn't. Things were hard. I mean, not as hard for me as some others, but they were hard. I had no money. Literally six weeks with no pay. My wife, my then wife, had to go out and work. Um, my parents were collecting second-hand toys of friends of theirs to give to them, both, both my son and I was passing around to other children. You know, it was, you know, six weeks is a pretty long time. No uh, strike pay as such, and that uh, it's all coming out of our own personal reserves. You're not going to rely on uh, vast savings? Um, well, no. The, everybody tells me I've got vast savings, but my bank manager doesn't seem to have them... I don't know where they are. You know. All of us had that experience, you know, um, of being asked what we thought we were doing. Uh, but it wasn't very sensible at the end of the day. After all, one's losing money. And that again underlined to me how difficult it is for a strike to actually benefit the strikers financially. It takes a long time to make up the money you've lost. Um, and... You know, it's, it's not pleasant. You get an awful lot of stick from your wives and families and things like that. The Ford women were under pressure to end their strike. Men were losing money. Do you believe in this women's strike? Huh? No, I don't. They're not no, breadwinner. they shouldn't get the same as lads. You don't believe in equal no, pay? No, no, no. Not for women. No. The men are the breadwinners and the, the women shouldn't go out and strike because a lot of them husbands work here. We went to the meetings, you know, each week that how things was going, and you'd get women from other, well, they was 
but it wasn't working there. But they called us everything for their husbands out on strike. <laughs> The one who was having the word with me was my mother. <laughs> <laughs> but we know uh, you should be getting back to work. You know, you shouldn't be putting these boys out. <laughs> well, it was her sons, wasn't it? She, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, well, it's just one of them things. It just happens. When we get it, they'll go back to work. But there was men on our side, wasn't there? Oh, yeah, there was men for us, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I blame the company, not the women. They went, I mean, more equal pay for the job they do, the same as the men. What do you feel about the women's strike? If they women's do strike? a skilled job, they should get paid for a skilled job. Do you think most of the workers here believe in equal pay for men? Most and women? of the workers believe in it. And most of the workers believe on extra pay for themselves and all. After striking for three weeks, the women got extra money but the company still wouldn't recognise their skill and regrade them. I think by then the women were willing to go back to work, weren't they? Well, I they? wasn't. I voted not to go back. Mm. Um, don't mind admitting that. I can't remember that. what I voted. Oh, okay. I can remember <laughs> I voted not to go back. But I was in the minority and um, you have to go with the majority, so that's how we ended up. You know, it eats away, it it eats yeah. away at you over the years. Yeah. You know why? You know yeah. why? Why, you know... Put you off, put you off this time. Be determined and don't go back until you get it. They will go on strike again in 1984. We just want recognition of our skill. That's all we want. For the lucky few, there was no financial pressure. George Easton was on his one-man strike against football slavery contracts for eight months. So he got a new job. That's when I went and did my cork salesmanship course. I did sell quite a bit of cork, actually. In fact, he earned more selling cork than he did playing football, but Eastham's pressures were internal. Obviously, I was missing the game. I, I'm football born and bred. I mean, it goes back in generations. I mean, my father was a... My uncle was a footballer. It's... It's what's in your blood, you've got to do it. Pressure comes in many forms. What do you say to the suggestion by the Housewives Association that women should withdraw their conjugal rights until the men go well, back? I Why should we make her husband suffer, uh, suffer in that way when they're not, on, they're not actually out on strike? When a strike ends, it's time to decide. Who won? Who lost? It was dawn. They'd lost a year's pay, but retained the things that matter most in these valleys, fellowship and self-respect. If anyone thought it was a defeat, now was not the time to say so. The men was at the front, and then there were the women, and then the miners who were going back to work. And there were tears shed by nearly all of us especially women. Some men were crying, yeah. Very, very emotional day that day. Very emotional. If the rest of the trade union leaders had have done the same work as the rank and file of the trade unions did, we would have won this strike. We would have won it. But they were all interested in gaining lordships and that. The public service workers claimed victory in the winter of discontent, even though it helped bring down the Labour government. They've agreed on humanitarian reasons to go back to work, but I'd like to say that they would like the support of the public within the the next four weeks, because the public have stated, and so have the government, that they're low paid and they deserve some consideration. We got the biggest pay rise that we've ever had in local government. After that strike, things improved dramatically. In, in, in relation to paying conditions, in relation to health and safety, in relation to welfare facilities on site. Highbury was still the scene of speculation today as the players turned up for training. Among them was football's problem boy, George Easton. Uh, I know when I first went to Arsenal, the directors were very friendly there. It was a whole new atmosphere, you know. The, the directors spoke to you on man-to-man terms. Footballers became human beings. 
after his eight-month solo strike, George Eastham spent another three years in court fighting the slavery contracts. Eventually, he won and went on to join England's World Cup winning squad. The pilot strike lasted 17 days and cost the company nine million pounds. They got a deal, but it was unfinished business. I think there was a bit of anger um, you know, at the end of it. We're, after all, the pilots are highly professional men um, carrying a pretty heavy responsibility and they became very resentful of being treated as they would have felt badly and not with any consideration of their skills. Victory finally came for the Ford women after they went on strike again in 1984. For 17 years, they'd been pressing their claim for recognition of their skill. Live now to Dagenham, where we can find two of the ladies who were in right at the start of this dispute. Was it worth all those years of fight? Yes, it was worth it. Now they've got it, I'm real pleased for them. What kept you going, though, for year after year? Determination. To celebrate, they let us have the canteen, and we had a party. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember much of that. No, really. I don't remember you didn't, no. <laughs> Carol Tung had bought this one bottle of champagne. Well, it must have been really, really strong, because I only had the one drop. She was out on the floor. They had to carry I've her never, own. never been, didn't remember a thing. I suppose it was relief as well. It was all over. The technicians defeated the ITV companies, but their power was beginning to wane. More than 5,000 workers were sacked in the whopping dispute. When a strike ends, it's time to consider its consequences. <laughs> Strikes make their mark long after they're over. They leave legacies and change lives. If the slogan on my banner means anything, it means working class solidarity, not just with miners, but with every section of the working class movement. Made me harder, I think, yeah. But uh, it also taught me a lesson as well. I weren't as naive as I was. And I found out that I could do things that I never thought I could, like get on a plane and fly to the other side of the world on my own, do things on my own. I've changed. And I hope it's made me a better person than I was. All of those months and all of that fight and all of that pain and hardship for nothing and would be in beaten. So I was feeling really depressed. Depressed because my marriage had ended. You know, everything had been fine beforehand and all of a sudden it's it's not fine. I'm not this nice, cosy uh, life anymore with me, me two daughters and my wife. After the strike, this miner came to me and he said, Anne, I want my wife back. I said, well, I said, it's over now. I said, you've got her back now. He says, yeah, I don't want her. I want one I had before. I says, well, that's your problem, not mine. On picket lines, people would come up to give us money and there would be lecturers and, and they'd chat to us and they'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, intelligent bloke. And I said, I'm not, I'm stupid, I'm just a miner. But it planted a seed in my head. And when the strike was over, I enrolled in university and did a degree and then did a PGCE and became a school teacher. What I learned about myself was that um, if one is deeply involved oneself in a story, as I suddenly was in the case of the ITN strike, um, I lost all sense of um, trying to see one side or the other side's point of view. When I found myself uh, taking a very clear point of view that the management could try to fork up more money. The interesting question is, what would have happened if that strike had gone on another week? It never came to that. But I would have been in a real dilemma if I'd been asked to come out on strike on election night. The communists down here, 13 of them, 28 Greens. Peter Snow finally confronted his dilemma at the BBC in 1994. 
A strike was called during the European elections. It seems to me that there are some occasions when a journalist should be reporting a situation to the viewers, particularly the BBC, which is a sort of national broadcasting organisation. It was a mighty hard decision to make, but I'm afraid I just said in the end, I'm working. And so I crossed the picket line. And, um, and then I, well, I felt I had to leave the union after that. I couldn't really stay on, having broken the strike. I clearly let the side down, and, and I admit it totally. But I think I had to. It's very quiet. Reservations seem to have taken care of all the passengers we did have booked, and uh, we are waiting for news. After the pilot staged another walkout, Norman Tebbit, the striker, also became a strike breaker. I felt that to some extent, the union had lost track, the Pilots Association had lost track of what it was doing. So I was a blackleg and I told the management that I was available for work. At the end of the day, whether you're in a union or whether you're in a political party, there comes moments when you have to say to your friends, look, I'm terribly sorry, you're wrong and you know, I'm not going to follow you down that track. Uh, part of growing up. How it's got to it is today, God only knows. Would you be happy with £30,000 a week? I'd be delighted. I'd be, I'd be jumping around doing somersaults. But then when somebody doesn't want 80000 and says, no, it's not enough for me, something wrong somewhere. Victory in the fight against the slavery contracts was bittersweet. Its legacy is player power and inflated wages. The boldness of LWT's proposals today reflects management's new toughness as it faces the erosion of its monopoly. Some strikers learned lessons on tactics and joined the other side. When I became managing director of London Weekend, I knew the ridiculous deals that had been done, and I set about undoing them. I took away the um, televisions and the videos. They've all been vented. I just gave them all to everybody and said, but we're not giving any more. That's the end of it. LWT is bracing itself for a possible strike over its plans. Programmes have been stockpiled and an arrangement is said to exist to transmit by satellite from Holland. We all pretended that we were going to run it from Holland. There was a, it got a story in the paper we were going to run it from Holland, so we all carried Teach Yourself Dutch books, you know, and all the rest of it. We weren't. We were going to run it from a garage in, in Woking, I think, where all the tapes were stored. And what was really interesting about it were the unions saying, you're trying to lock us out. Now, for years, they'd gone into negotiations saying, we're going to go on strike if you don't do this. And suddenly the whole position had been reversed. And it was at that moment you knew that... It was all over for the unions in television. We have a great deal of sympathy, but we can't agree with the action that's being taken. If you withdraw public services, you're not going to get the support of the public. But we didn't realise how vicious it would be. Um, the animosity and the hatred in some cases uh, that was directed to those people. Put it in its context, I don't think that you would ever see cemetery workers involved in strike action again. The legacy of the 1968 Ford women's strike was Barbara Castle's Equal Pay Act. And I thought to myself, there is some of the old spirit that gave us the success of the suffragettes. It became a landmark in the fight for sexual equality, but its significance wasn't obvious at the time. You didn't think about it. So All really, you thought about is you've got a little bit extra money in your wages. Mm. But you didn't think that uh, you'd done an achievement. Well, I, I mean, didn't, so anyway. More or less, like, we're like the women that chain themselves to the... Suffragettes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we didn't that, chain though. ourselves to no, anything. No, but it, we, no, <laughs> we, we didn't... Um, we, we didn't do anything no. about that. <laughs> I think possibly there was a a feeling on the part of the management that this guy is very reluctant to stand in line neatly and tidily when, when he's asked and um, he's too much of a maverick. The pilot's negotiating team told my deputy chairman that uh, 
they wanted to change the management. In other words, it gets awfully near to Balpa wanting to run the airline. I was told afterwards that uh, my file was subsequently marked unsuitable for management. This caused me some wry amusement years later uh, when um, British Airways, as it had become, was responsible to me as a minister and I was appointing the guys to the board and appointing the chairman. <laughs> this is Thatcher's new Secretary of State for Employment. He's the man the union leaders love to hate. The legacy for a former Bolshe union activist and strikebreaker was to push through changes to the law that would radically reduce union power. All those proposals were built on, really on my experience. I don't think I had the support of the majority of the cabinet. None of them had had the experience that I'd had on the shop floor um, of trade union work. Uh, so my view of what we should be doing was totally different to theirs. And um, they were very uncertain about it all. And they'd all had their fingers burnt, of course, in Ted Heath's time. Um, and I was getting quite worried about the discussion going on. And at the end of it, the Prime Minister looked round and summed up and smiled sweetly and said, well, then it's clear the Secretary of State has got the support of the Cabinet for his proposals. And um, uh, thank you, Secretary of State, you should go ahead and publish your white paper and we'll get on with it. And one or two people looked quite surprised. <laughs> Due in no small part to Norman Tebbett's reforms, by the 1990s, the average number of days lost per year to strikes was around a tenth of what it had been in the previous three decades. Former strikers disagree about the benefits of killing off what was once known as the British disease. It was hard. There was times I thought, what am I doing this for? But I kept on doing it because it was the principle of the thing. What else is there? What else has working class got? Only to strike and demonstrate, else nobody will take any notice on you. I think um, collectivism, as we know it, has disappeared in our society. And I think that is sad. Um, I think it got killed. If this is injustice, you could do something, couldn't you? Because you had the union behind you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now they can't. They can't. And now do they this. haven't got the union behind them, so they just can't do it, can they? And because they got what they wanted, they got greedier and greedier, which is no different, I guess, from the bankers and the pres present credit crunch. <laughs> They're just the amounts are different. In a strange way, they were exciting times because you were never sure whether you were going to be in work or out of work. I used to pray for rail strikes when I was a train spotter because it meant that all the trains would be sitting switched off in the sheds so we could go along with our notebook and write down all the numbers at once. It was brilliant. Would I go on strike again? I could do. Yeah, sure, if I was in that position. Um, it's, it may be a bad judgment, but it's not an immoral judgment. Don's got a new right-hand girl in a few moments here on BBC4. Stay tuned for the latest brand new instalment of Mad Men. <laughs>